Today is about bee inspired. It's about what can we learn from bees. And um, as Steffi mentioned, uh, I am the founding director of Biotopia, uh, which is a new museum planned for Munich, which you may have heard of earlier today, uh, which is a life sciences and environment, uh, environmental museum, which we are creating at Schloss Nymphenburg in Munich. And one of the key areas on which Biotopia will be focusing is on what we as humans can learn from other species. Uh, so today, with the help of three outstanding creative people, we'll be talking about what we can learn from the bees. So, what can we learn? Well, uh, the last week has been a strange time for bees. Uh, so, the good news is that on Thursday, uh, thank you, uh, on Thursday, the EPA finally decided and uh, officially announced that uh, neonicotinoid pesticides are damaging for bee populations. So that was great news. Um, the strange thing is that on exactly the same day, the EPA announced that it would not be introducing any regulations for neonicotinoid uh, pesticides. Um, so that's a, the EPA is clearly able to live with paradox and uh, this uh, sort of a post-factual world uh, uh, that we are in, now in. And it's, Kind of interesting because how did the EPA come to that decision? Well, the bees would not have come to that decision. Uh, and uh, there's a wonderful book called Honey Bee Democracy uh, that some of you may have come across. And it's a book which is written by a Cornell professor called Tom Seeley. And it's all about democratic de decision making among bees. And it turns out that when honeybees make decisions, on how to identify a new nesting location, uh, a new nest site, uh, they make decisions democratically based on fact-finding and debate. Um, so bees make highly informed decisions. So uh, Celia is very interested in how, as humans, we can, our decision-making processes can actually benefit from observation of bees. But today, we are going to explore other territories where bees have much to teach us. So we're going to be hearing about uh, bee robotics uh, from a roboticist who is uh, now switched on to bees, who is Tim Langraf from Berlin. Uh, we're going to be hearing uh, about artistic expression inspired by bees from Wolfgang Buttress uh, of the famous Hive project. And we are going to be hearing also about an astonishing new drug delivery system uh, designed by Mark Koska, which has a, a a sting in the tail. Uh, so um, I would now like to ask you, how, does any of you know about the bee waggle dance? No? Would anybody like to demonstrate it? <laughs> OK. Well, in the hope that he might show us the bee waggle dance, I'm going to invite onto stage from the Free University of Berlin, Tim Langraf. <laughs> Thank you. There's the clicker. That's the clicker? Yeah. OK. I'm not going to waggle my tail again for you. Um, well, maybe later uh, in a private session. Um, uh, I have some video material for you, uh, which should suffice uh, for, for, for now. Uh, well, so uh, Michael John, thanks for, uh, for the introduction and for inviting me. Also, thanks uh, Ian Cousin. I don't know where you are, but uh, you are thanked here. OK, uh, so my name is Tim Landgraf. I'm, in, uh, I'm based in Berlin. I'm a professor in collective intelligence and biorobotics. And with a background in computer science, computer vision, and robotics, it's pretty obvious that I had to move into biology, um, which is what I do with, uh, with bees and also with fish. And I'm going to talk today about how to um, use you know, conventional robotics uh, to learn more about uh, real animals, okay? So that's what I do. Okay. Okay, what is the bee dance? So bees do fantastic things. And when I started um, doing my PhD and doing science, I was like, yeah, bees are small little insects. They, you know, pretty much small robots, right? Sensory information comes in and, and, and they do something that is pretty much pretty, pretty, pretty defined. And the more I went into studying bees, I, I, I became fascinated by how um, complex they are and how intelligent they are uh, individually in the field, by navigating in the field and finding resources and bringing that information back. Um, and also 
collectively how um, complex their interactions are. Okay, so one of those marvelous things that I found is known for like more than, than 70 years, and it's called the bee dance. So we have one forager bee that finds the food source. What happens then is she flies back, and that could be over several kilometers, very far away, and she keeps that memory of that place and encodes that into what we call the waggle dance. So in the left video, you see a slowed down version of that. So the, so the bee is, is waggling her body from side to side, moving forward in an almost straight line, and then she turns uh, left, waggles again, and turns right, so that in the end we have a, like a figure eight, okay? So it's that way, okay? And the cool thing now is that all oh, those bees that stand near her, those bees run after her and decode the dance. And the content of the dance is essentially a coordinate saying, go in that direction and you'll find food or whatever, uh, water, uh, pollen, raisin, in a distance of such and such. Okay, so it's a polar uh, coordinate which is crazy for an insect. Remember, it's 14 millimeters long. It has a, a one by one by one millimeter uh, brain of not even a million neurons. And we don't know how that works. We still, in, even in those simple animals, we don't know how, that, how those bees can remember locations and translate that into, into motions. We do know, by, by looking at it, what the content of the dance is. But we have no idea of, what, uh, of, of how followers decode the content, okay? So imagine you are in a dark hive. There's no light in there, okay? It's a dark box. I'm not allowed to, to you know, be in the audience to, to have like a, like a small demonstration, but we should do that. So imagine, close your eyes, and imagine you know, there's chaotic movement in, in the hive, and, but, and then there's you as a follower should decode the... The, the, the angle on the comb, yeah? There's chaotic movement, vibration, scent and odors and, and, and heat and all those cues, and from that you should decode where to go. Pretty hard to do, and it remained, re, still remains unknown how, to, how they do it. And so one idea, not my idea, people had the, 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 this idea before, is to build a robot that imitates the dance and so we can switch on or off certain components of the dance. Let the robot not vibrate the wings. Let the robot not be hot. Uh, let the robot not carry scent and so on. Those components are coupled in the real animal. And we cannot ask the bees not to uh, flap the wings or not to carry a scent, right? That's impossible. But the robot, we can program, right? This is how it looks like. That's what goes into the hive. So that's a bee-sized thing. Uh, it has wings. It can deliver drops of, sh of sugar water. It can be heated up. It moves in a 2D plane. It's a, basically a plotter that I bought on eBay for $16, 1980s something built plotter. And I put some motors on it so it moves as bee move um, in, a, in a dance. And then we open up the hive like now, and then we stick the thing in. And by, by moving it in, we are, we are closing this aperture again. And then, then I can move in there, and then I can talk to the bees. Okay? This is what I do. This, you know, three summers, I was doing that for nine weeks. Okay? Like, uh, I don't know, uh, staring around at bees. Yeah, a bee cocktail. Okay, this is what it looks like. So, um, it's not so well um, um, contrasted, but... Uh, I mark this green bee here, who does exactly the same thing as with real dances. She follows and decodes the content of the robotic dance. The robot, of course, never ha has been outside, has never seen anything uh, outside, does not carry outdoor orders. And so, well, now we would like to see, does this bee go where the robot says it should go? Well, in order to, to answer that question, we need some more technology to track the flight of the bees, and this is uh, implemented by this system. It's a radar dish taken from a ship to the field, 
and then we put those two, uh, those, those silver wires actually on top of a B, we call those transponders, and those are built such that they reflect this radar uh, rays, okay? And so we, we see the green dot here is actually a B uh, flying in the field. And from that, we can infer whether they uh, were able to decode the dance or not, okay? And this is what comes out. Uh, this is the green line saying where the robot danced to. This is the, the green line saying where the robot danced to. And then at some, some, in some occasions, they kind of partially obey the message and then go where uh, they had been before. Okay, so this is a very, very quick, uh, you know, uh, blast over what I, what, what I do in biology. Of course, I do something um, you might be more interested in because um, many of you uh, like to see products and applications. And um, I'm going to uh, ask you to come next year uh, and, and, of course, the organizers to, to invite me to, to next year's DLD so I can give you some examples of how to apply what, what we have learned in, uh, I don't know, in uh, technical systems. Um, just on the side note, uh, what we do now is uh, we want to understand uh, why the robot sometimes do, did not really work well. We don't really know why sometimes it just doesn't, uh, um, isn't, isn't, um, or the, sometimes the, the bees really, uh, really don't uh, respond to the robot. And, and so we, we glued those markers on the backs of all of the bees, 2,000 bees, it's quite a laborious thing. And then we track them, and so we analyze, um, well, the heck out of it, okay? So who's doing what with whom? Where do they dance? Who's dancing with each other? What have they been doing before um, until the point when they meet in, in the dance direction? And so we practically cover uh, the whole life cycle or the whole life uh, time of a bee. Uh, we record uh, nine weeks, 24-7, um, uh, three frames per second, um, 48 uh, megapixels per recording, 200 terabytes of image data, supercomputing, <laughs> big data, okay? Okay, that's it. I guess uh, we need to know something about uh, what, uh, what you do, Wolfgang. Um, yeah, sure, thank you. Okay, that's it, thank you. You can sit down on the stage here, I know. Uh, yeah. so did any of you go to Expo in Milan? Anyone go to Expo? So w did you visit the UK Pavilion by any chance? So here we, uh, the UK Pavilion at Expo was an outstanding success. And uh, our next speaker created that pavilion, which was called Hive. He's an artist who takes inspiration from bees, Wolfgang Buttress. <laughs> oh. uh, can you hear me OK at the back, yeah? Yeah, so my name's uh, Wolfgang Buttress. Uh, I'm an artist based in Nottingham. Even though my mother's German, uh, my auntie actually lives in Munich, and it was beautiful serendipity. It was her 70th birthday yesterday, so I managed to spend some time with my cousins as well. So thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, so what I'd like to talk is just a, a little bit about the Hive projects in, in, in Milan, uh, when I went to Kew Gardens, and I'll finish off with a little uh, short video. In my studio in uh, uh, Nottingham, there's seven people that, that, that work there. And then Tom on the left in early 2014 said, are we going to apply? It was an international competition uh, to do the UK Pavilion uh, in Milan. I was a little skeptical. Uh, the, uh, the theme of uh, the, uh, the project was feeding the planet. And how do you express this really laudable theme in a pavilion which is 100 metres long by, by 20 metres wide? And I've been aware of the, the plight of the honeybee over the last sort of three or four years. And as the, the honeybee itself, it's, uh, it can be seen as a sentinel uh, of the planet. They're exquisitely tuned to their environment. So the healthier the, the, the hive, the healthier the colony, the healthier the planet. And sadly, the reverse is true at the moment. They're suffering in uh, unprecedented numbers due to pesticides, uh, uh, global warming, uh, and monoculture. And so, uh, a moment of serendipity, I met this incredible scientist called Dr. Martin Benchik, and I wanted to try and express this problem, but through, uh, through an experience. Uh, it would have been fairly easy to do an abstracted sort of sculpture of a honeycomb, but it needed to go deeper. Like, when I was a kid, I used to sort of think that, like, art and, and science were kind of polar opposites, and as I've kind of got older, I've kind of come to realize we share a lot of concerns, uh, this kind of search for meaning in the world. And... And what Martin Benchik does, he, uh, 
He's, a, he's developed this understanding about how bees actually communicate with each other, and then from that, how we can actually learn from that themselves. This is uh, usually what you would imagine when you, when you hear bees uh, inside the hive. It's very sort of dark, but you have no real sense of what actually goes inside the hive itself. And so what Martin Benchik does, he puts these tiny little things here called an accelerometer, which measures vibrations. So in real time, we can understand what's happening uh, in the hive, whether it's busy, whether it's quiet, uh, whether it's healthy, and whether it's unhealthy. Here's a really uh, important day in the life of a, a hive. It's just before the swarm. You can sort of see it's very quiet there, and it goes red as the swarm's going to go. And I thought, if we could use this data uh, to actually kind of express in real time inside the sort of sculpture what, what the beehive is, uh, is feeling, perhaps uh, the public that would go and sort of see this would have, a, would have an empathy. When you go really deep into the sounds of the, uh, 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 the beehive, th this is uh, the sound of two honeybees quacking. And I never realized how bees talk to each other like this, and it's the most incredible, deep, haunting sound. And uh, what I wanted to do was, uh, was express this as light and sound. So this was a, a, a first computer model we, we did. You can sort of see uh, the lights themselves, and they're reacting in real time to what's happening inside the hive. In the, in the, in the, day to, in the evening, this works really well. You have, the, uh, uh, you, have the, uh, you have the lights in the evening, but I wanted to obviously express this uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the daytime as well. When I first picked up a, a hive, there was this incredible, uh, deep, resonant hum, which kind of seemed to really connect me to the earth and uh, through the bees as a conduit. So uh, we went to a recording studio in, in Nottingham and invited a couple of friends of mine who were playing a band called Spiritualized. Uh, this is Deirdre uh, uh, Benchik, she's the a cellist who play, who's the wife of Dr. Martin Benchik. And very quickly she realizes that the bees actually hum in the, in the key of C. So she started to play the cello uh, along, with, along with the bees. Uh, Camille started to sing and we had this amazing epiphany of the sound of the human voice, uh, the cello and the bees themselves. And we spent the, last, the next two weeks improvising in the key of C. We recorded... Uh, about 200 different musical stems, which we actually would, which would be activated by the live signals from the beehive. Uh, so in the morning, uh, when, when the bees are very quiet, uh, there would be a, a sound of a violin or a cello. And in the afternoons, when the bees are more active, they would, they would, uh, trans they would uh, trigger off a piano or a guitar. So it would be like a symphony, and it was all activated by the bees themselves. So I had the idea, the concept, and then how do you actually realize this in, in, in sculptural form? Uh, it, was a, it was a long, uh, complicated process to do. We had one year from, from winning the competition to, to building it. And this is the central part of the, the, the experience called the hive. And you can start to see the analogy between how bees make the honeycomb and the hive itself. This is the final piece which uh, Damien put in right at the top there. And there was 170,000 different components to make up the sort of sculpture, each one, uh, each one completely different. One of the other ideas was, was almost a, this, this idea that you, I wanted the, the audience to actually be inside nature. Usually when you walk through the countryside, you're stamping on the, the ground like this. So the idea was to bring, to, bring, to bring the ground up to waist height so you would sort of feel and sort of sense uh, the bee's journey actually in nature. So as a bee would kind of look into a wildflower meadow, you would have this sort of sense of immersion. This is the hive itself. You can, set, you can start to see the people inside, and it plays with this idea of uh, the micro and the macro, that we're all connected. As you get closer to the, the hive itself, you start to see uh, the structure. From afar, it looks quite chaotic, like a swarm. And when you get under close, there's a glass floor, and it kind of, it suggests this honeycomb, but it's the glass floor itself, so there's a slight sense of kind of danger, a frisson. This is inside the hive itself, and again, it's working with nature, actually inside the hive, it was always three or four degrees cooler inside the hive than outside, very much like a real beehive regulates its sort of temperature, using the oculus at the top as a, as a chimney stack effect. Uh, one of the amazing things which kind of happened, which none of us really ever anticipated. Uh, the expo itself only went on for, for six months, so we, uh, I wanted to document it. And I was keen that the, the hive would have, a, would have a second life. 
and uh, Jeff Barrett from, uh, from Heavenly Records, who really liked the music, and he sort of said, oh, we need to kind of release this as, as a record. We thought it'd maybe sell 20 copies. Uh, I think it's on its fourth press, and it went to the 10 in the vinyl charts, which is mad with a, with a bunch of bees. And, and on the back of that, we played a load of performances. We played Inside the Hive. We played at Glastonbury Music Festival last year with a live stream of bees. This is a... Uh, is actually playing underneath the hive it's itself, which was in his vote one of the Guardian's best gigs of 2016. So this is the hive here at uh, Kew Gardens. It's the first UK pavilion ever to kind of be uh, to reinstall, to have a, have a second life. And to me, that was always always really important. We had 3.3 mi uh, million visitors in, in, in Milan, but only 1% was actually from the UK. So to go back and have a second life to tell this really important of the, of the honeybee is really important. So this is the, the video, and I'll pass you on to Mark. Thank you much for your time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Wolfgang, and please grab a seat. So how convenient that bees hum in the key of C. It's just uh, amazingly serendipitous. Uh, fantastic work, thank you. Um, so from dancing robot bees to bees as a source and a generator of artistic expression, now we go on to bees as inspiration for transformation in global healthcare. And we have uh, our final speaker, you've heard from him briefly at the beginning, uh, became famous for the creation of the K1 syringe, uh, which was a non-reusable syringe uh, invented to prevent the spread of HIV, and now has a, a new invention, which has been very little discussed in public, but which has a connection with bees. Mark Koska, Thank over you. to you. Um, just to explain, I've been messing around and inventing uh, new devices for safe injections for about th over 30 years. I started in 1984 when I read a newspaper article and it inspired me uh, after reading that, uh, the prediction that the majority of HIV was going to be spread by healthcare and the reuse of syringes to do something about it. And sadly, I think that has come true. I invented this product, as Michael said, called the K1 syringe, and we've been lucky enough to um, uh, be very successful with it on a humanitarian basis. It has three features. It's made on the same machinery as a normal syringe. It's made for the same price, and it's used in exactly the same way, but it can't be reused more than once. We've been able to sell around seven billion of these now, uh, with the biggest supplier to UNICEF, and um, it's used in about 100 countries on a daily basis. We've been credited with saving over 10 million lives, and obviously as a team, we're very, very proud of that. And finally, last, uh, last year, I was able to convince the World Health Organization to um, do something which, which was very clear, which was to put in a policy which says that by 2020, all syringes in the world have to be um, auto-disabled, which is the generic name of, of this product. Now, I've been working in the field, as I said, for over 30 years, and what I've been witnessing along the, uh, along the way is some really bad outpoints that exist in public health, in the delivery of public health. And one is the distribution of medicines. As you can see here, it's done by hand at the very final moment. And of course, it would be unrealistic to expect it to be done any other way. But it is a major flaw in the way that we try and distribute healthcare around the world to people who need it. And also, the limited number of healthcare workers. There are various numbers that come out of Africa and out of India and out of China about the ridiculously small ratio of healthcare workers to the number of public. One in 2,000, one in 5,000, one in 10,000. So it's absolutely impossible to imagine that drugs that are created and medicines that are created for enormous uh, investment in the West, which are then sold for profit, can be uh, generically supplied to the dis to, and distributed throughout the developing world because we simply don't have the manpower to give the injections and to distribute them to those who need them. So observing this, I was thinking about the problem one day, coupled with an argument that I had had with some people at work, and I was really furious about uh, the particular topic we were arguing about. And I went home, and we're lucky enough to have three beehives. 
And we're fascinated by bees. My wife and I have been keeping them for about five years now, and we're absolutely in love with our, with our bees and, and how, they, how they operate. And what I realized was that what I was facing uh, the challenge of was trying to re-engineer products that have been around for over 100 years. A syringe is over 160 years old, the design for a syringe. And a glass vial that you can see in the slide here has also been around for well over 100 years. And both of them have terrible, terrible problems. A syringe doubles in size when you load it up with a dose, so it's very large. And it has to be large to be able to accommodate that volume because you're pulling back a plunger. And glass vials are unbelievable. They take six months to make. They're very hard to cool off um, excess volume if you have an epidemic of something or if you need them in an emergency. And for many other reasons, glass vials have had their time and they need to move over. So what I invented was this product called K7. And essentially, it is modeled off how a bee stings. It's a little blister, like a bubble wrap blister, mounted on a platform. The top section is a flexible um, film, which will be filled with liquid, which you can easily depress with your thumb and give the injection out the front of the device. And there are various other features which we can go into. They can be made in any size up to 3 ml. So we can make them from 0 0.05, which is the size of a tuberculosis vaccine, all the way up to 3 ml, which is some of the bigger treatments uh, programs use for HIV, for example. We can also fit this with a safety needle, which is one of the criteria that WHO are introducing for 2020 as well. Now, injections are given in various different formats, from intramuscular, which is straight in, perpendicular to the body, normally into a muscle, quite deep, but also on the very, very surface of the skin, point one, of a, uh, one millimeter deep, which is called the intradermal. And if I was going to design a decent device, a device to challenge this sector, I would have to be able to mimic all of those. And we're able to do that. We've now actually got clearance from the World Health Organization that we can do this. So back to the glass vial. The glass vial itself has a lot of problems. First of all, let's just imagine the transport. You've got to ship that vial from a fantastically high-tech and uh, beautifully laid out factory in Austria, let's say, all the way around to Chad in Africa. And the number of times that glass vial gets dropped and vibrated, etc., And they reckon over 10% of all vials break on their journey to the end user. But there's a product that was invented in Stuttgart 60 years ago. And it's absolutely amazing. And I bet all of you have used it. And it's what you get eye drops in. These little plastic vials, which are incredibly robust. And they're made by a beautiful system called Blowfill Seal. A glass vial takes six months to make. This product takes six seconds to make. A glass vial has to be washed and sterilized 13 times before, before you can put a vaccine in. This sterilizes itself during manufacture and only takes six seconds. Costs about a 20th of the price of the glass vial. But what we weren't able to do was use these um, for injections. And we've never been able, in 60 years of history, be able to do that because we can't put a needle inside this very soft blister. If the needle penetrates the blister, it hits the healthcare worker or the patient, and therefore it's actually been banned that you can use these for injections. So I designed my product to be filled from the back. So it, the needle's at the front end, if you imagine a small or longer needle on the front end of this K7, and we plug the bottle and the blister together, and we squeeze the bottle and fill the blister that way. We can actually determine by the shape of the neck and the shape of the join that there's a security that someone who's untrained can't put a hepatitis vaccine into a polio vaccine delivery device because we can have a, a, a triangle or a square or a pentagon which only fits to the particular drug. So we can increase security far above any that we've ever seen in the past. Now, these are very small, they're very robust, and we can suddenly see that the dream, and I've been in many of these conferences talking about drones for years, and they've never, they are being very successful, but they're moving syringes and glass vials around. What if we can minimize what we're transporting? Suddenly, drones can become a lot more useful, and in fact, in a box this big, 
we can ship 5,000 vaccines and delivery devices um, with this system. They can be made in a whole variety uh, pack, like a, a chocolate box. So we can have some for polio, some for hepatitis, some for HIV treatment, and shipped all in a tiny little box and delivered in, in the most robust way that you can imagine. They're very small and a couple of advantages. We, with a 40-foot container, a sea container, with uh, normal syringes, we fit a, just under 2 million in a 40-foot container. On this system, we can fit 16 million. Imagine reducing the cost by eight or nine times to the UNICEF program for moving these products around, and they're very interested. It's better for manufacturing. We use much less materials. It's better for um, storage, for use. And the best thing of all is we've just got approval that this device, and it's the first device in the world, could be used by untrained personnel. So a dad can deliver to his kids. He doesn't need to go to a healthcare worker. And that really is a game changer. And I've got to thank the bees, because without them and without that argument and without us having beehives in the garden and thinking, how would a bee give an injection and realizing that it's like a sting, um, I would never have come up with this. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. So maybe just to start, uh, I'll open it up shortly to the floor, but um, to start maybe Mark, um, uh, new drug delivery systems are often plagued by problems with the market. I, I think of, for example, inhalable insulin and uh, the, the, the fate that it had with the market. Uh, how can you be sure that this will catch on? Well, I think that what, what I've been able to, I've got a lot of experience, and I, what I now know for sure is that we can offer an advantage for every single step of that delivery chain. We can offer an advantage financially to the drug manufacturers, the packagers, the shippers, all the way through to the end users. So programs are, are showing incredible interest, uh, the big UN programs, because we can actually deliver to the, much more efficiently to the ultimate goal, the patient. And maybe just to come back to our theme, then, so all of you have been inspired by bees in, in very different ways, uh, from, from the science, the investigation of the bee dance, to artistic expression, to, to healthcare. Um, how did you come to the bees? Maybe we can start with you, Tim. Well, it was um, a side did project. did they come to you? Huh? <laughs> maybe <laughs> they came to you, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I always had this thing about animals and, and, and nature, and I always wanted to understand how things uh, work. Of course, we, um, most scientists that I know, uh, even if they're not in neuroscience, want to understand how humans work, right? We want to understand how we, I don't know, how, how we work, how we do things, how we accomplish things. And um, so I was always interested in animals, and uh, bees were... Um, were a side project with, with uh, Randolph Mensel, and I had to uh, uh, write a tracking program for antennas. They were restrained, and in in, the bees were re uh, restrained, and uh, the research question was whether they sleep or not. And we measured sleep by tracking antennae, and that was the program that I wrote, and then I got hooked. Great, thank you. Wolfgang. Well, I think, I think for me, when I was a kid, you always used to think of bees as little things which would maybe sort of sting you, they might be a little bit irritating, maybe a little bit scared of them. And I think the more I've come to realize that they don't actually want to sort of sting you, they're incredibly calm when you actually have a swarm. Uh, we put some, uh, actually caught a swarm and put some bees inside a cello in a, like another art project that I did. And they were crawling over my head and my beard and they didn't <laughs> sting me once. But there's this real sense of... of uh, it's the sound, it's this the hum and, and the smell of the actual hive. It's, it's incredible. I think we can learn a lot from them. I mean, individually, as you sort of said, the brains are really small, but together they're like a super organism and incredibly intelligent and perfectly formed. I mean, Mark, you said you are a beekeeper, so uh, clearly you have a deep interest. Um, but in your work, is it a conscious thing that you, that you look to nature for, for inspiration that you do? biomimetic designs, is that something, are you constantly looking for new examples of natural features that you can imitate in your inventions? Always, I mean, it, obviously it's a bit of a cliche that you know, nature's had four billion years head start on us, but um, I, I, uh, I didn't go to university, but if I had, it would have been to study biomimicry, but sadly there wasn't a course at the time. You have to uh, change that. Yeah, we need to change that for sure, because 
it, there's so much inspiration. And we kept bees simply because, you know, we've got a garden and why wouldn't you? It, would, it was just a natural thing to do. And I wish we had done it sooner. But, um, you, know, the, you, can, you, you know, you can obviously find the simplest um, bit of inspiration from something that, that nature has worked out. And there's nothing more complicated, as Tim has demonstrated, than, than a bee. No one's yet worked out probably 10% of their behavior. Um, and yet the simplicity of their sting, of which I've had a few, um, you know, is fascinating. Not that you don't eventually pick them out, but to see this bladder trying to protect the hive, um, you know, because it's stinging you or their, their prey is just amazing. Great. Well, I would lo love to open it up to the floor. Do we have any questions from the floor for our bee people? Yes? Over here, this one? Yeah? Do, is there a microphone perhaps in the room? Uh, yeah? Is there anybody Nobody with a microphone? To to us. Or maybe you might oh, have yeah. to shout. Um, well, uh, every year in the world, about 50 billion syringes and needles are made. Um, they're not all um, used once, sadly, and that's hence a lot of my work has been involved in. So it's well in excess of 50 billion. But what, what this new project does by moving to the untrained sector is it allows that number to, to grow where necessary to give life-saving uh, delivery of medicines and vaccines. And it's been a long-held desire of all the health agencies in the world to try and, you know, get these numbers up. I think they're running at 60%, 70% now. And if, and if this is a vehicle for getting that up into the 90s, then obviously I'd be very proud. Any other questions from the floor? Uh, nope. So um, maybe just to say, we, I mean, we, we only have a couple of minutes more anyway. But I hope your heads are buzzing with ideas. Uh, and, and I hope you are feeling inspired, not just by the bees, but are by three extraordinary creative individuals who, who are doing tremendous work to help us understand bees and also to transform our lives inspired by bees. Um, and uh, it's been a, a privilege for me to be up here with you guys. Um, and just to, also to, to mention that tomorrow we will move from the bees to the birds. Uh, so if uh, you're interested, uh, we will be having another session tomorrow, uh, which is called Biotopia. Welcome to Biotopia. Uh, and we'll be looking at collective behavior uh, with Martin Wachowski, Ian Cousin, and uh, Augusta von Bayern, who you probably uh, heard earlier, who was uh, given the Burda Award, uh, the Anna Burda Award uh, for Creative Leadership. Uh, so thank you so much to the panelists. It's, it's been wonderful, and uh, look forward to more buzzing ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.